Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Carl, uh, Carlos Garcia Mateo uh, from the National Center for Metallurgical Research in Spain, in Madrid. And he's going to talk to us today about nanostructured steel industrialization. So, over to you, Carlos. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Carlos Garcia Mateo. I belong to the National Center of Metallurgical Research. and. What I'm going to present here today is a story. It's a story of the results we obtain within this consortium with all these research groups, companies, steel makers, and final users under the auspices of a European project. Um, nanostructured steel industrialization, a plausible reality. So it was in this same house at Cambridge University almost 15 years ago where Caballero and Badesia, using Badesia's finite phase transformation theory, developed a set of alloys, a set of steels that allowed for the transformation of austenite into vinite at very low temperatures. The transformation temperatures ranged from 120 to 350. As a result, they did obtain this beautiful and elegant microstructure composed of vinitic ferrite plates, the white feature, with just between 20 and 40 nanometers of plate thickness and some retained austenite also in the range of the nanoscale. The plate thickness increases their, their size as the transformation temperature increase, obviously, and the hardness also decreases as a result of that increase in the size. Some issues or some, some other peculiarities of the transformation is, of course, a part of the high density of strong interfaces, given the, the nano size of the phases we are dealing with, is as it is a displacive transformation, the, the plastic deformation that accompanies the transformation is accommodated, and through the generation of this location of nano twins, as those you, that you can see here in the high resolution TM micrographs. As it is a diffusionless transformation, uh, the carbon, once a vinitic ferrite plate has finished its growth, tries to escape from the vinitic ferrite and goes into the parent austenite. On its way, it might find dislocation and twins, and it might get trapped. It might get just clustered in carbon clusters, as those measured by atom proof tomography, or trapped in dislocations that has been observed also as cultural atmospheres in, in atom proof tomography. So the carbon is not the I mean it's not homogeneously distributed. Uh, it's not uh, we, we have two types of morphologies of retained austenite. We have these blocks of retained austenite trapped between the sieves of vanitic ferrite. Uh, in the case of nanobain, instead of being the typical uh, blocks uh, with a micron size, as you see, is some micron. And then we have the thin films trapped between the plates of magnetic ferrite. Both of them have very uh, distinctive carbon content. As you see in these results, the smaller the austenite feature is, the higher the carbon content is. And we'd rather have that type of morphology than even the sum micron, because the mechanical response and the stability is much better. So no wonder the mechanical properties we did obtain with such a fine microstructure were good. We obtained UTS over two gigapascals, accompanied by very reasonable uh, toughness. And most of the strength, uh, as I said, it came from the size of the microstructure of the matrix, the vanity ferrite plates, and the amount of it that we have in the microstructure, but also from the dislocation density. But there are other ways to produce a nanostructure steel. Uh, we can do it by martensitic transformation, but we need very expensive alloying elements. We need rapid cooling rates, so we, we have problems with recalcitrance during transformation, or we may introduce some residual stresses. We can use ECAP or other severe plastic deformation techniques. We can use warm deformation, friction steel processing, or advanced thermomechanical processing. And this is the range of mechanical properties in terms of GL strength and uniform uh, elongation that you can obtain. But as I said, we have problems of expensive 
alloying elements, recalcitrants. Um, we have a problem also with the amount of material that we can treat and the shape that we can achieve. But if you think about the range of mechanical properties we can obtain with nanovane, with such a simple heat treatment, uh, there is a big potential for, for this type of alloys. So it is not strange that a group of researchers, steel makers, and final users gather all together to form what it was known as the Nanovane Consortium, just with one aim, take a step forward to the industrialization of these nanovane alloys. For the design of the alloys, we use fundamental and industrial design considerations. And those considerations can be summarized as follows. We wanted, obviously, a carbide-free microstructure because cementite is a hard and brittle phase that we wanted to avoid at all instances. So we know uh, that an addition of 1.5 silicon in weight percent is more than enough for that purpose. If we want to have a competitive uh, alloy and we want to put it into the market, it has to be a simple alloy system. So we keep it in this system, carbon, silicon, manganese, and chromium. Fairly cheap and fairly common alloying elements. Uh, we want the transformation of austenite into vinite to happen in reasonable times, as the two first generation took like, let's say, a 215 days, and then the second generation took like a week or a bit more. We, that, that industrial is not, it, it, it will never put a, an alloy into the market. It's too long. So for that, to reduce the transformation time, we took two approaches. We reduced the prior austenite grain size, and we tailored the chemical composition so the free energy change of the transformation would suit our purpose. Final user had in mind two, uh, two components. One, which is pretty big, and the other one is smaller. Uh, for the big one, the isothermal heat treatment was going to be applied by salt bath, bath, the other one by dry vein technology. And in any case, there are, uh, again, there are some models, uh, thermodynamic base, that again, playing with the chemical composition, we can uh, change the free energy of the transformation to suit the hardenability that we need. As we want a hard material, a hard microstructure, we want to keep the fraction of vinitifluoride as high as possible, and we can do that playing with the T0 line and keeping the transformation temperatures low. But keeping the transformation lo temperatures low is also a, a, a way to have a smaller plate thickness, to have more thin film morphology as compared to, to blocky austenite, so it suits our purpose in terms of mechanical properties. Again, we can do that just knowing how to calculate the BS and MS, the free energy changes implied in both transformations. So again, just by means of, of chemical composition tailoring, we can keep the transformation temperatures very low. So we end up with a set of nine alloys. Uh, one group with nearly 1% of carbon, the other one with 0.6, 0.7. The high carbon content is to ensure the high strength and low BS and MS temperature. Silicon in sufficient quantities to avoid the cementite precipitation. Manganese and chromium for hardenability purposes. Niobium, it was added to control the pre austenite grain size through the carbon nitride precipitation. And the extra, the molybdenum and the extra silicon, it was added to get an extra strengthening on the austenite prior to the vinite uh, transformation. So we expect it to have even thinner uh, plates of vinitifluoride. So as you see, we managed to have a simple alloy system. is silicon, manganese, chromium, and in some cases some moly and some niobium, but in really small quantities. We keep the transformation temperatures very low because the transformation it happened between 220 and 350. Uh, it is a nano microstructure. As you see, for the higher carbon, uh, the worst scenario was 40 nanometers at the higher temperature we tested. Uh, for the 0.6 alloys, it was below 70. And it contains a higher fraction, a very high fraction of vinitic ferrite that in all the cases it was almost above 70% in all the cases. It was faster, 
as compared to the benchmark alloys we use during the design process. This is the time taking for the benchmark alloys at 200 and this is at 250 and 300. As you see, in general terms, we managed to obtain a, a increase in the transformation kinetic and we managed to get sufficient hardenability for the bigger component, which was uh, the most critical in, in terms of hardenability. This is the microstructure we end up, okay? Blocks, some micron blocks, look at the scale of the, of the micro. Those are some micron blocks of retained austenite, the thin films, at these little whiskers, the black features are the bainitic ferrite. This is the one carbon silicon treated at 215 degrees during 16 hours. So no wonder the mechanical properties, the strength, it was so good. I mean, we have a nanoscale microstructure with a high fraction of the harder phase, which is bainitic ferrite. So UTS in all cases is above two gigapascals. We have GL strengths almost over 1.7 for the higher carbon and 1.5 for the lower carbon. But, uh, and the uh, ductility level is quite reasonable given the, the strength levels. I just want to point out these two cases, which are just extraordinary combination of strength and ductility. For the one carbon silicon treated at 250, the total elongation is, all, is more than 21%. The uniform elongation is over 10%, well above. And for the 0.6 carbon niobium treated at the same temperature, 250, the level of total elongation is almost 20%. So we were quite impressed with those results. We measure also well properties as rolling sliding were test. And what we did is compare it against some reference material, as for example, the 100 chromium-6, and some others use it for those applications with different type of microstructure. B stands for bainite, C for carbides, B for P for perlite, sorry, and M for martensite. And as you see, those are the results for all those microstructures. And when we compare it with the nanovane treated at different temperatures, we obtain a completely different behavior. Even for the same level of hardness, the behavior of the nanovane, it's 50% uh, better than for the reference alloy. Uh, one of the outcomes of this work, it was the importance of the hardening of the surface of the, of the nanovane alloys. As the experiment went on, the transformation of austenite into martensite, which is a hard phase, kind of controlled the, the, the amount of material that it was removed from the surface. There were another type of uh, wear properties. This is the high pressure abrasion. The, the final user usually does that type of experiment where we press uh, over a, a chunk of our material, of our uh, nanobay material. We press it against an abrasive material at this interval during this time with this force. And uh, what we, uh, we did is compare it against the the reference material, which is the hardox, which is a very expensive material with high nickel, high moly, and, and chromium content, treated to half of uh, at this hardness. As you see, the behavior, which is in, in white, is pretty good compared to the reference material. Uh, but uh, the final user don't use only this um, high pressure abrasion. He also uses the uh, charpy uh, to make a selection of the material. So. If we compare all together, the toughness multiplied by this HPA, what we can see is naturally a selection of three states of this nanobite that perform much better than the reference material. Fatigue properties, uh, rotation bending on notch specimens. There are several reasons to use the, the notch specimens as the, the final product will have a stress concentration. Fatigue is sensitive to the austenite decomposition and to the cleanliness and inclusion level. What we see is that for the three different states that we tested, the 0.6 carbon behave far much better than the higher carbon. Okay, and this is on par with the reference material, which was a 100 chromium-6. So based on the results that we had so far, we did a material selection to fabricate this material at industrial level. 
uh, for the big, for the small component, uh, we look for a strength and ductility balance. So we went for the high carbon silicon, the one carbon silicon. For the small component, uh, sorry, for the big component, uh, keeping in mind that we needed hardenability uh, and we, would, we wanted a good balance of uh, HPA and Sharpie performance, we went for the 0.6 carbon niobium. On the way, during the, the selection process, um, we realized that this, this alloy was giving, we, we performed some theoretical calculations, and we realized that uh, we were going to have, we anticipate some problems with the primary niobium carbides in the liquid state. So we changed uh, the approach, uh, and we decided to go for carbon vanadium system to control the prior austenite grain size. Uh, we did a battery of tests on, on lab scale uh, uh, casts, and we find out that the microstructure is the same, the harness, the BS and MS temperature were exactly the same, but even the, the kinetic was slightly faster. So finally, we fabricate that at industrial scale. Um, these two alloys, the one carbon silicon at the 0.6 carbon silicon. And before fabricating components, proper components or, or demonstrator, we run a battery of tests to, to check if things were changing or were exactly the same. Very fast, this is a comparison of the result of the lab scale and the industrial scale in terms of strength and ductility, which are roughly the same, no big differences. If we compare the result in terms of where rolling and sliding of the nano lab scale compared to the industrial scale, we improve even the wear resistance of the material. Um, for the same level of hardness, which is this 100 chromium 6, I mean, the, the, the level of, of wear is almost just 1%. Just take a look to this one that correspond to the one carbon silicon with almost no wear at all. So we were, and the final user was pretty impressed with, with those results. I, in terms of the other type of wear, the HPA, the high pressure abrasion, um, we used the 0.6 carbon vanadium. We did two heat treatment at 220, which was the lowest temperature, and 280, which was slightly higher. And the performance of the 280 compared to the hardox material is just impressive. We tested the fatigue properties. Um, you see the industrial material and the different conditions. What you see here is that a uh, let's say for the same material, same cleanliness level, the UTS, the higher the UTS, the higher the, the fatigue resistance is. Uh, if we compare again the high carbon and the lower carbon, the, the results of the one carbon silicon are worse and were unexpected somehow. Um, there were some problems during casting and the cleanliness level, it wasn't as good as expected. If we compare the industrial, the industrial scale and the lab scale of the 0.6, we see that the performance is very similar. Um, Bosch, that was one of the final users, uh, tested for notch tension tension specimens, which is even more representative of the injectors they were aiming for heavy loaded uh, diesel engines. Uh, we have here the results of the reference material Okay, uh, and as you see, again, the 0.6 carbon vanadium alloy uh, is performing much, much better. Well, it's performing like the 100 chromium 6, but with much lower UTS, which is also a very good result. Uh, the one carbon silicon, it wasn't performing as, as good as expected. And it's still under research. Uh, Bosch went a step forward and fabricated what they call a demonstrator for the injector. It has this shape. And the results, they tested both alloys, the, the, again, the carbon vanadium and the one carbon silicon. And I think they are pretty happy with the results of the 0.6 carbon vanadium, not that happy with the one carbon silicon. Uh, they think there is still room for improvement, as most of the failures in the 0.6 carbon vanadium happen on titanium carbides that they found on, on the surface on the, on the cracks. This is the big component fabricated by Mezzo Mineral. Uh, this is the size of the component. 
is fabricated of the 0.6 carbon vanadium treated at 280. I have to point out that the microstructure after the heat treatment was completely homogeneous through the whole section of the, of the piece, which is pretty big. The, this piece is used as a scrap share blade and Metro Mineral estimated a gain of almost 20% due to the, the use of a significantly cheaper material. Before leaving into the conclusions, I would like to highlight what we think it was the biggest achievement in this project. In just over three years, the Nanobain project took the concept of nanostructure vinitic steels from a laboratory experiment to a full-scale industrial product, uh, produ production and testing. And we did that just solely by using the phase transformation theory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Carlos. Are there any questions? Hi, so um, I'm, this is really interesting. Um, as you know, obviously, um, your work has previously kind of produced steels with um, values that are now famously quoted by Harry as a K1C toughness of about 45 megapascal root meters for uh, strength levels of around 2 gigapascals or so. Mm -hmm. I think that was your work. Um, and this one, the, the K1C value has dropped quite considerably. Uh, it's um, not K1C, what we measure here. It was a Sharpie test, the results I saw. Was it Sharpie in the original? Uh, the old data it was... No, no, there was, so there was a slide very early on. Yeah, 20-something, yeah. Yeah. That, that is reported in, uh, I can't remember which publication it is. Uh, it's all data. So yeah. that's not this alloy. No, 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 no. In this alloy, in this alloy, is we the only fracture we tested it was Sharpie, and it was okay. tested by Metso Mineral to to find out which material okay. suits so, the purpose. Okay. And so, what um, what Sharpie values were you getting from this alloy? Um, um, say for two gigapascals strength. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think I miss it. Yes, I miss it. Yes, HPA should be, should be here. Yeah, oh, there those are. Okay. Oh, wow, so that's actually quite impressive then um, yeah. compared to previous work. Okay. I mean, the material is impressive. What do you well, expect? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I just got confused because I thought you've halved the toughness. What's going on? But that was all data. Okay. I mean, considering the two gigapascals just as a standard of UTS, I, I think it's pretty good. Okay, so you haven't done fracture toughness on this alloy? No, okay, one second, no. Okay. Not yet. I mean, we, we are running a second European project focusing now on fatigue properties and trying to understand what lies beneath. And at the same time, we are performing a lot of research in terms of what is controlling ductility, which is, is, is a pretty yeah. tough issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? What is the time of uh, uh, outstamping uh, in your uh, steels? Um, for the 250, is lower than 15 hours at 250. 15. Uh, that is for the one carbon silicon. I cannot give you. I mean, the the, Euro, the final report is on the web. It's in the European, so you have the exact numbers there. But uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's in logarithmic scale. The but I'm talking about a 220, something like 30 hours, mm -hmm. and a 250 between 12 yeah. and 16. It's acceptable for industry for uh, yeah. 40 hours. Yeah. Be, I mean, what you are obtaining is something you cannot, cannot obtain in, in such a cheap manner otherwise. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we did it shoulder to shoulder with final users and with uh, steel makers and heat treatment companies, so yeah. Okay, did you study the uh, transition temperature from ductile to brittle? No, no. we didn't know. Mm -hmm. okay. um, maybe you know that uh, we made a combinatorial thermodynamics computation to estimate the most important uh, elements contributing to shortening the treatment and we concluded mm -hmm that uh, manganese reduction was very, very Sorry, strong. Sorry? Manganese reduction yeah. was strongly contributing to reducing uh, yeah. treatment. So 
if you chart all your alloys, uh, heat treatment temperature versus manganese content, do you see that trend? Um, I mean, of course, it's not. Yeah, uh, it's not represented here. To be honest, I, right now I cannot answer you. But we, we always try, yeah, I mean, if we decrease too much the manganese level, you, you know. I mean, the, there is a moment where you have to balance between this, uh, how fast the transformation happens, at, at which temperature you want it to happen. So manganese helps you to deplete the BS and MS. It's true, it makes the transformation very sluggish. But yeah, I mean, manganese it has a strong effect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any internet questions, Steve? Should I say that? Um, hello, Carlos. Carlos. Yep. Uh, you choose for the 2.5 uh, silicon, I raised the high value. Uh, yep. Why? Uh, does it better help the I mean, of the yeah, the, um, I did not choose the consortium, did it? I mean, because there were many interested in implied. But as you see, I mean, Take a look to this result here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the combination of uh, strength and ductility is pretty impressive. Can you give a metallurgical explanation for the better properties? Not yet, not yet. I mean, we, we are thinking, in terms of ductility, we don't know yet. We, we put this extra silicon because we knew silicon is a solid solution a strengthener mm -hmm. of the austenite. And we expected to have a even thinner magnetiferite plates, but it was of the same order as the, the other alloys. So it's like we reach it a, a lower limit or we cannot resolve. Uh, but I don't have an explanation right now. I mean, we brought a paper and we speculated of some of the reasons. Maybe it's the distribution of the retained austenite, but we don't know if silicon is directly linked to, to that fact. Maybe it's the stocking fault energy, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, vanadium, the vanadium was used um, in a later stage just to substitute the problems with the niobium. It was to control the prior austenite grain size uh, during the austenitization prior to the isothermal heat treatment. A small prior austenite grain size creates more nucleation sites, therefore accelerates the transformation. It was another approach to accelerate the transformation. Hi, Carlos. Um, so what do you think the difference in terms of um, mechanical properties between the nanobane and the superbainite produced by, uh, commercially produced by Tata still at the moment is? I don't think there is any. I think this consortium aimed to, to look for a set of alloys that suit their purpose. Uh, we have final users, they had pretty clear what they wanted where they want it, and what was the mechanical properties range in which they can move. So we were looking for a new family. I, I yeah. No, just the composition and the properties look identical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what, was, what was the produ industrial production route for your uh, industrial heat? I'm sorry, I don't have the details. Uh, it was Sidenor, Gerdau now, and it was Asco Metal, the ones that so produced the... So it would have been an, an, an electric arc um, heat? Probably. Probably. Probably, by, a, pro, 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 no. probably by an ingot route? M Matthias is also from the consortium, consortium. I can probably try to answer it. It was not an abnormal um, route for the industrialization, so they just yeah. put in... In industrial heat, um, as, as far as I know, for ASCO metal, they just put in industrial heat um, in their normal sequences and um, fabricated 100 tons yep. and scrapped 90 tons um, and kept 10 for the, for the um, so it experiment. A, it, was a, it, was a, it was a bloom concast route then, was it? Yeah, it was bloom, yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, in that case, thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you.